Well, good morning and welcome everyone. My name is Claressa Surtees and I'm the Clerk of the House of Representatives. As we begin, I would like to acknowledge the tr traditional custodians of the Canberra area. I pay my respects to the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, for whom this has been the meeting place for thousands of years. I also acknowledge the cultures of any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. We have gathered here to launch the printed edition of Order Order, a biographical dictionary of speakers, deputy speakers and clerks of the House of Representatives. This project has been a collaboration of the Australian Dictionary of Biography and ANU Press and the Department of the House of Representatives. Welcome to the Speaker and members of the 47th Parliament. And I welcome former Speakers and Deputy Speaker of the House and former Clerk and Deputy Clerk. As well as Speaker, the Honourable Milton Dick, we have with us today six former Speakers. We were having a bit of a discussion about this earlier this morning with Speaker Dick and the members of the Speakers panel. And we were looking for a collective noun that would adequately <laughs> describe speakers. And, and one of the uh, members on the uh, panel suggested that it should be ruling. So that didn't sound too bad, so I might test that one out today. So for today's ruling of speakers, we have Professor the Honourable Stephen Martin, the Honourable David Hawker, Ms Anna Burke, the Honourable Bromwyn Bishop, the Honourable Tony Smith, and Mr. Andrew Wallace. Also present are the Honourable Bruce Scott, who served the House as Deputy Speaker, former Clerk of the House, Mr. Bernard Wright, and former, a former Deputy of the House and a key collaborator and contributor for this project, Ms. Catherine Cornish. I acknowledge family members of two former clerks, Alan Tregear and Jack Pettifer, it's great that you've been able to join in today. And I also recognise some family members of other key parliamentary uh, actors and officers of the, of the House. I also extend a welcome to our Australian National University-based collaborators, Dr Stephen Wilkes from the Research School of History and Postgraduate Researchers and staff from the Australian Dictionary of Biography and Research School of Social Sciences at the ANU, as well as some of the authors of the biographical entries in the dictionary. And one final welcome to anyone joining us remotely through the Parliament's website. I mentioned that we have received apologies from, from uh, the for some former speakers, the Right Honourable Ian Sinclair and Mr Harry Jenkins, and former clerks, Messrs Lynn Barlin and David Elder, who are unable to join us. While the shared experience gathered here does not quite stretch over the 120 years covered by the Dictionary of Biography, it's rich in history nevertheless. We have a former speaker who served as a member of the House from 1984 in the 34th Parliament and was elected speaker in the 37th, and a former clerk who commenced his parliamentary career on the last sitting day of the 27th Parliament in 1972, and who served as clerk during the 42nd, 43rd and 44th Parliaments. In terms of the formal proceedings, I will shortly invite the Speaker to the rostrum, and he will be followed by Bernard Wright, former clerk of the House, to round out formalities, Dr Stephen Wilkes, who is editor of the Dictionary of Biography, will make some remarks. Before handing over to Speaker Dick, I thought I might make an observation on something uh, that captures one element of how the business of the House and support for its work has changed over the years. Perhaps somewhat surprisingly, the number of days and hours of sittings of the House has not significantly increased or decreased as a trend across the years. However, the scope and amount of business transacted by the House during its sittings tells its own story. The Clerk of the House holds the records, including notes made by clerks and deputy clerks at the table, as well as signed copies of bills. Uh, committee reports, petitions and government documents presented 
um, that form the basis of the votes and proceedings or the formal minutes of meetings of the House. These are held in compactus shelving in the basement here at Parliament House. The increase in the scope and amount of business transacted might be um, indicative by, of the volume of the votes, as we call them, produced. The first compactus in the archives holds the records of parliaments from 1901 to 1941, the first 16 federal parliaments over 40 years. The second compactus holds records of the House from 1941 to 1963, 22 years from the 16th to the 24th parliaments, so roughly half the number of years and parliaments as the first. And the third compactus covers the years between 1963 and 72, nine years, um, from the 25th to the 27th parliaments, once again roughly halving the number of years from 22 to nine and a reduction of records of eight parliaments to three. The fourth and fifth compactuses cover periods of five years and from there the number of years of records held rapidly dwindles such that for the last 17 compactus units recording proceedings from 1989 through to the present, uh, they have records of two years only in them. The House of Reps archives presents a very physical demonstration of how the business has increased over the years. And this increase in proceedings and transactions is reflected in the increased work that is required of its presiding officer, the Speaker. Um, the increase in the volume of business is, is only one aspect, of course, and as we know, the House um, has been under uh, an ability to be more greatly scrutinised by the community since radio broadcasting commenced in 1946 and since the televising of uh, Question Time in 1991. And on top of this, of course, we now have uh, streaming on the Parliament's website of every minute that the House is sitting and uh, the so-called 24 hours news cycle uh, certainly indicates that the social media is full of representations from the Parliament um, all the time. So technology has certainly um, impacted on everyone's capacity to not only support the chamber but to uh, tune in and view the proceedings in the chamber. With that, I now invite the Speaker of the House of Representatives, the Honourable Milton Dick, to make some remarks. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk, and good morning, everyone. Can I too start by acknowledging the traditional owners on the land of which we gather, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Welcome to the launch of a special collaboration between the Department of the House and the ANU. And to say that I am bursting with pride to be standing in front of former speakers is an understatement. Uh, I'm a little nervous as well, particularly when they'll be coming to question time today, and it's like being judged by the former school principals uh, in your environment. But to our former speakers, Professor and the Honourable Stephen Martin AO, the Honourable David Hawker AO, the Honourable Anna, Anna Burke AO, the Honourable Bronwyn Bishop AO, the Honourable Tony Smith, and to Andrew Wallace, my immediate predecessor, and to Bruce Scott and Mrs Joan Scott OAM for their attendance today, I'm truly humbled to be in your presence today. To the former clerk, Mr Bernard Wright, and Ms Catherine Cornish, behind every great speaker there is a brilliant deputy speaker, and that is today's Ms Sharon Clayton, the member for Newcastle, and also a brilliant clerk, Clarissa Surtees, who I will talk a little bit about today. And to Stephen Wilkes for your labour of love. I had a quick chat with um, Stephen before, and his work is an important milestone, I think, for the chapter of this parliament, but also for this country. Now, many of you know, uh, as a speaker, my driving passion is to improve civics education among school children across Australia. 
I've visited 20 schools so far as Speaker, and this year I'll be visiting the 10 most remote schools in Australia and taking Parliament to those schools to improve civics education. And I know my parliamentary colleagues that are here today, both ministers and backbenchers, I welcome your support in this initiative. And central to civics education is making sure we have the resources available to learn the history of our democracy and institutions. We can learn a lot about our institutions by looking at the people who have dedicated their lives to serve them. So by learning about our past speakers, deputy speakers and clerks, we can understand and appreciate the contribution they've made in shaping the House of Representatives, its practice and procedures. We've got a group of people here today who have made that exact contribution, former speakers, deputy speakers and clerks and deputy clerks. And as for someone who's been in the role of the speaker for just under 12 months, I find it so fascinating to look back in time to understand where practices and procedures have come from. The stories of our former speakers and clerks offer valuable insights into the way the parliament has evolved and responded to the various challenges since Federation. This includes two world wars, the Great Depression, the constitutional crisis of 1975, and more recently, COVID-19. Being the first speaker overseeing the first parliament, Sir Frederick Holder had provisional standing orders based on previous colonial assemblies. The standing orders have been since shaped by members and speakers over the decades. As we know, the position of speaker is modelled in the United Kingdom's parliamentary practice, dates dating back to the 1300s. And over the time and in the decades, speakers and deputy speakers have shaped the role into something of its own for our Australian parliamentary context. Unlike in the UK, Australian speakers continue to contest their seats after their appointment and have largely retained their party affiliation. A speaker must therefore fulfil their duties in an impartial chair while continue to be accountable to their constituents. Since the first parliament in 1901, the House has seen an increase from 75 to 150 members, and the number of seats is likely to grow further with Australia's population growth. The increase in membership has its effect, effects on House business, for example, the, in maintaining order during question time and managing the allocation of the call. Maintaining order is the fundamental task of a good speaker. Around one third of all members since Federation have at some point had to be disciplined by the chair because of disorderly conduct. And as the political landscape changes and we are seeing a growing trend towards diversity and equality in Parliament, we can look back in history to when women were first represented in Parliament in 1943. But it wasn't until the 11th of February 1986 that our first female speaker, Joan Child, was elected. Speaker Child oversaw the transition from the old parliament to our new parliament here. She became heavily involved in the final stage of fitting out the new parliament house. She grappled with matters ranging from the design of courtyard gardens to carpet patterns, the safe depth of steps, the natural lighting of offices, and the danger of falling into the water feature in the members' hall. She was the first speaker to preside in this building. And Speaker Child hoped that the televising of House proceedings would result in improved behaviour of members within the chamber. Dare I say, I think she may have been disappointed. At, at last but not least, in 2019, we saw the appointment of the first female clerk of the House, Clarissa Surtees, who I've had the honour and privilege of working alongside every day I am here in the parliament. I thank Clarissa on behalf of the thousands of people who work and serve in this building for her leadership, guidance and patience with speakers as well. Many speakers, deputy speakers and clerks have, a, have left a lasting legacy on the House and Parliament and their stories will no doubt continue to inspire. And I want to finish a quote from Sir John Maclay on his, first, on his final week as Speaker. Provided you umpire the game and only umpire the game, and don't try to kick goals, all the players will appreciate you. Thank you, and I now pass on to Mr Bernard Wright AO, the former clerk of the House of Representatives.
Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, distinguished guests and friends, um, it is indeed great to see our retired speakers with us today, all looking rather relaxed. Uh, it might be that comfortable distance from that rather warm chair a couple of levels below us. Um, uh, to me, order, order is welcome because the stories that it tells of 65 key office holders are so interesting and so informative. Can I suggest that it, I think it's welcome in another way? Um, I think members' responsibilities for the nation's present and for its future allow little time for public reflection on its own history. Um, and so, to me, order, order is doubly welcome because it should encourage a little institutional reflection. Mr Speaker, there are good reflections and bad reflections, and institutional reflection has got to be a good thing. So, before returning to order, order, I'd like to reflect in the parliamentary way, the good way, on the roles of speakers, deputy speakers and clerks. Um, their work matters because the work of the House matters, and you know, they are at the centre of that work. Not political leaders, but, if you like, leaders within the institution. They help shape the framework of the place. Um, but yet, in a sense, they're also, I think, followers. Um, and I think those perspectives leading, often following, um, can be seen repeatedly from 1901 to the present. Um, in the first parliament, the speakers, the chairman of committees, the old term for what we now call the deputy speaker, and the clerk played leading roles in the development of standing orders and in the application of constitutional provisions. They laid solid foundations. And in the decades that followed, um, the expanding role of the national government saw the holders of those officers involved in the necessary evolution and adaptation of house practice. And I think it's, so it's been in our own time. Changing needs, responses and adaptation. Uh, there's been reference already to televising from Clarissa and from you, Mr Speaker. Um, the introduction of televising in 1991, as expected, took Parliament to the people. I think that was intended, but what wasn't foreseen, I think, was the true uh, extent of the impact that televising would have on the dynamic of the House and therefore on the work of the speakers and the deputy speakers and the clerks, but especially the presiding officers. Um, and televised question timing in particular attracted quite a following. Um, and long before social media, people wrote in and few did so to express their admiration. <laughs> and drafting responses to these letters became something of an industry, a minor industry in the department. And all speakers have felt the criticism of the House keenly because yeah, they were acutely aware of its shortcomings, but they also knew that goodwill characterised the great majority of its work and cooperation, most legislation passed, probably still to this day, by at least 60% support. But um, uh, this was not sort of um, at all visible and speakers knew that public recognition of that good work did matter. So successive speakers and deputy speakers and clerks certainly encouraged reform within the House, things like uh, in the consideration of legislation, the development of a House committee system, um, in uh, the provision of better opportunities for private members. Um, and uh, great success on those you know, working arrangements. Um, but as well as those improvements, in some matters existing practice has been strengthened in our time. For example, uh, during minority government in 2010 to 13, early precedents on the casting vote were dusted off, um, studied, explained to members, and then applied with absolute consistency. Uh, that was welcome certainty in uncertain times. Um, but ironically, during those years, the casting vote was not given as frequently as might have been expected. 
But that was precisely because there was certainty about it. If calculations showed that a vote uh, would be tied, uh, the government was able to adjourn the, devote, adjourn the vote rather than um, see it go on to completion only to be lost on the predictable way that the casting vote would be uh, used. Uh, they're technical matters, but they are first order matters as far as the integrity of the speakership and House uh, procedure is concerned. Um, in our time also, uh, practice on the financial initiative uh, was uh, affirmed and developed. Speakers have been vigilant in uh, safeguarding the rights of the House in relation to the Senate in respect of Section 53 of the Constitution. These matters, also very technical but really critical to our system of government, uh, they're matters of compliance with the terms of the Constitution. Um, Edmund Barton his famous statement during one of the convention debates remains relevant, short but very uh, fitting. If government is finance and finance is government, these clauses are amongst the most important. But Mr Speaker, these matters might be uh, treats in store for you, um, not too suddenly I hope. Um, I, I must say speakers have been thoughtful students of House of Reps practice. One confessed to taking a copy to the beach during the summer break. I must be discreet, so I will just note that she didn't tell me whether she had enjoyed it. <laughs> um, the work of speakers, deputy speakers and clerks has long extended beyond the procedural uh, uh, and beyond the administrative matters that they're burdened with. Um, for example, in helping to strengthen democracy in developing countries. In 2016, the clerk's office had arranged a program for deputy speakers from the Pacific, that was here in Canberra. Um, dates had long been set when the election was called. Well, as you'd guess, the show went right ahead. Um, in fact, two former deputy speakers, two former speakers rather, joined the speaker and the deputy speaker uh, as presenters, and that was not the first time that such help has been given. And as you might guess, our speakers, their deputies and House staff are highly regarded by their international peers for their support of these sort of initiatives. They're valued, they're recognised, they're valued as respectful and constructive contrib contributors by their peers. Um, I, I should also say that uh, this project has been a welcome cl collaboration between the ANU and the, uh, and, the, and the House of Representatives, the National University and the National Parliament. As has been mentioned, we're indebted to David Elder for initiating it, to Catherine Cornish and her colleagues for carrying it forward so successfully, and to Clarissa Surtees and her team for managing these later stages. We thank Dr Stephen Wilkes for his uh, leadership from the university and his personal uh, contributions, one of the, uh, some of editing others' uh, contributions and for writing his own. We thank our 36 biographers. Uh, speakers are accustomed to being in the spotlight, but uh, the spotlight shone by our volunteer biographers has been of a more considered kind, thankfully. Most of them also contribute to the Greater Australian Dictionary of Biography. Uh, the strict rule on the ADB is that only the dead can be included, so it's quite a relief that nobody has had to die to win inclusion in this volume, <laughs> isn't it? Um, may I also take the opportunity to uh, really uh, say that Speakers have been so often generous in their uh, uh, expressing gratitude to House staff for their support. And I would like today to express my thanks and the thanks of other parliamentary staff and other clerks for the great support that we've all had from the speakers with whom we've had the privilege of working. Uh, and I should also acknowledge the great support 
of their spouses and partners. Um, I should also uh, record my thanks to uh, the former clerks with whom I've had and my contemporaries have had the privilege of working. We saw in them the qualities, the personal qualities and the professional qualities that had earned them such wide, widespread respect and even affection. Um, I uh, m m might say that whatever happens in the Parliament, it is worthy of study. And I would say that also uh, that as far as order order is concerned, it, it will reward those who invest a little time in studying it. The stories of 65 people included remind us that ultimately the House, the Parliament, that groups of people, it's not a building, they are groups of people with all of that means, the strengths, the weaknesses, the idealism, the pragmatism and so on. It also reminds us of two cases where a son has followed his father and I wonder might we look forward to a case of a daughter following her mother in one of these offices. Uh, order Order will help speakers of the future and their deputies to see their work in a wider context. And they too will see that they will have the opportunities to win uh, the confidence of members and respect more widely. Clerks of the future will see their work also in the wider context and they too will have opportunities, not the least being the opportunity to lead a team uh, of committed professional and enthusiastic staff colleagues. So our warm congratulations to all who have worked so successfully to bring us order order. Who knows, in time it might also find its way to the beach during a summer adjournment. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you all so much for attending, particularly those of you who contributed to producing Order, Order. Too many to name all of you. Uh, but I will mention uh, one or two, particularly Catherine Cornish, formerly of DHR, is here. Um, I will also, I must mention, sadly, a contributor who died recently, Peter Love of Swinburne University, and, of course, Jen, who's right there. Now, we also have, as we know, quite a number of speakers here, former speakers and a current speaker, not to mention deputy speakers and a second deputy speaker. Arguably, possibly, I'll have to check this, is Parliament's greatest ever assemblage of presiding officers. And I'm afraid, I'm very sorry to report, I've been gazumped on the line about what is an appropriate collective noun. But I can suggest perhaps a presiding of speakers or an order of speakers. Well, and very unfashionably, let me salute all parliamentarians, all DHR staff who are with us for something you share with the 65 people um, featured in Order, Order, a choice of career in public service in the best sense. Now, the 65 covers only those who are not currently active in parliamentary politics, so I'm very sorry, a few of you will do miss out, you'll just have to wait. And no doubt we've made the odd error here or there or misjudgment, so sorry again, folks. Now, I do confess I have a few favourites amongst the 65. There's one right there. But one other is John McGregor. McGregor was clerk for just a few weeks, September 1927. He's known today only for the fact, or hitherto, prior to order, order was known only for the fact that he was the one who had a fatal seizure in the chamber, right in front of the budget speech, on the first working day of the Parliament in Canberra. Earl Page, whom I've written about, and uh, Neville House attended to him, the two doctor members. Considered to be a very bad omen, I wanted to try and bring Jack, or sorry, John McGregor, back to life, to give him a fuller life, in that sense. So I did that one myself, I confess. Now, Order Order is a work of collective biography as history. History of that most fundamental of disciplines. For example, it is history, awareness of history, 
which is the basis of the conventions which underlie the functioning of these three parliamentary offices we mark today. One last thought. Outside the Australian War Memorial stands a statue of John Monash, only fairly recently erected two or three years ago. Now, nothing odd about a Monash statue right there, except it is John Monash in civilian garb. John Monash not holding any sort of weapon, not even a ceremonial sword. Instead, he's brandishing a book. He is gazing purposefully towards this very parliament. But the punchline is the inscription, a quote from Monash himself, the only hope for Australia is the ballot box and an educated public. Two concepts to which I hope order order will make its own small contribution. Thank you again. Well, thank you, everybody. You've been very patient. Um, that concludes the formalities for um, our session, um, so thank you very much for coming along. Thank you.